about non-pharmacological treatment modalities and NAFLD. Uh, NAFLD is closely related to the triple epidemic of obesity, diabetes, and inactivity, and can be defined uh, as the liver manifestation of the metabolic syndrome. NASH can progress to serious disease stages, fibrosis, cirrhosis, liver failure, or hepatocellular carcinoma. Patient with NASH should be targeted for treatment, especially if they have fibrosis. On the beginning, we must clear out the crucial question, how to evaluate the effectivity of non-pharmacological treatments and what and how to measure, and then who, when, and how to treat. We have already seen the three steps approach, how to manage this patient in clinical practice. We must ask three simple questions. Is there NASH or fibrosis present? Is intervention needed? And if so, what kind of intervention is indicated? When we actually think what are the hard points for progression and what kills these patients, we can find two things that are all expressed, inflammation and fibrosis. NAFLD independently increased risk of mortality. The main cause of that is cardiovascular disease, and liver-related complications are the third leading cause of death. Results from a large population-based cohort studies of almost a million people in the UK found that the chance of dying for NASH over a 15-year period was approximately two times higher than for those with simple steatosis. Fibrosis stage independently and regardless of presence of other histological features is the most relevant feature associated with overall and liver-related mortality. Overweight and obesity are associated also with increase of all-cause mortality and liver-related mortality. High BMI is associated with increased risk of all-cause mortality. Cardiovascular disease mortality and certain cancers. Also, waist circumference is a risk factor for mortality, regardless of BMI. GGT was also positively associated with increased risk of cardiovascular events and total mortality. Neither the presence nor the severity of hepatic steatosis predicts liver-related or cardiovascular-related or total mortality in the short term. A key issue of the management of patients is the identification of those who are most at risk developing of clinical meaningful outcomes in order to target them for the therapy. Use the non-invasive markers can divide this patient in, into the three categories. Green box is for patients with the low risk category, with very low risk of progression and outcomes. High risk category is pretty close to the end to the complications, even when they look compensated, and these are the people who are in the risk to fall off the cliff in the ne next five years. We can intervene in the different times and phases of NAFLD, but the early intervention brings biggest profit for the patient. We can prevent not only the hepatic complication, but also decrease in cardiometabolic risk. Having addressed who to target with the therapy, move to the intervention itself. Epidemiology suggests a close relationship between an unhealthy lifestyle and NAFLD. Diet and lifestyle changes are mandatory in all patients. Weight loss reduces liver fat, improves insulin resistance, and can result in a NASH regression. Lifestyle is the core and cornerstone on which you can build everything else because NASH is a disease driven by lifestyle. Patient must achieve calorie restriction and weight loss. And the bottom line is, there is a lot of diets out there. What you need to remember is that this pathology is caused by caloric imbalance. This is beautifully summarized in this clinical practice guidelines of American Heart Association. And the key message is, a variety of dietary approaches can produce weight loss in overweight and obese adults if reduction in dietary energy intake is achieved. It was not clear 
how weight loss affects histologic features of NASH. This publication shows association between the magnitude of weight loss through lifestyle modification and changes in histological features of NASH. The highest rates of NASH resolution, fibrosis regression, occurs in patients with, uh, with uh, weight loss more than 10%. When you lose more than 10%, you can clear your steatohepatitis, and the probability of achieving fibrosis regression is pretty high. The problem, of course, is tra translating these findings into our clinical practice, into my Slovakian audience and public because our public and our patients don't listen to order to, of the doctors so like Cubanian patients do. The Mediterranean diet was first described after the results of seven country study, which demonstrated that these populations had a lower incidence of cardiovascular disease and cancer. This diet is connected with consumption of fresh vegetables, fruits, whole grain products, legumes, and olive oil with a low intake of red and processed meats. The combination of these foods and lifestyle have beneficial effects on several metabolic pathways. Mediterranean diet is beneficial for NAFLD, and the benefits are demonstrated not only for liver steatosis, also for other metabolic dysfunctions. This diet is particularly attractive due to its potential to improve not only NAFLD and even without reaching weight reduction, which is the main obstacle in lifestyle and lifestyle and treatment. Consumption of sugar is the next issue. And sugar consumption, mainly fructose, is associated with obesity, diabetes, and NAFLD, and other cardiovascular events. Uh, advanced glycation end products are reactions of sugars with fat, amino acids, proteins, and nucleic acids. There is a clearly association with metabolic alterations and also with liver damage, with steatosis, steatohepatitis, fibrosis, and also liver cancer. Here you can see the exam examination between intake of sugar sweetened beverages or diet soda in the Framingham of spring cohorts. Sugar beverages consumption was positively associated with ALT levels. And regular sugar sweetened beverage consumption was associated with greater risk of fatty liver. Dietary fructose consumption was in other studies independently associated with NASH. Determination of effect of nine days of isocaloric fructose restriction on de novo lipogenesis, liver fat, and visceral fat, and insulin kinetics in obese American children with high sugar consumption was done in this study. Short-term isocaloric fructose restriction decreased not only liver fat, also visceral adipose tissue, de novo lipogenesis, and also, there is an improvement in, in insulin sensitivity. This finding support efforts to re reduce sugar consumption in the population. High red and processed meats consumption is related to several diseases. Cooking meats forms heterocyclic amines, which have harm harmful effects for the health. High consumption of red or processed meats is directly related to NAFLD and insulin resistance. Therefore, limiting the consumption of unhealthy meats may be advised. Given the key role of the lifestyle interventions in the management of NAFLD, there was a need for strong, detailed evidence on the effects of exercise and diet. The aim of this meta-analysis was to evaluate the effects and aspects of exercise and diet on liver enzymes, intrahepatic fat, and liver histology. Regarding type of exercise, aerobic compared to resistance exercise did not yield any superior improvements on liver parameters. Moderate carbohydrate diets yielded similar changes in liver enzymes compared to low-fat diets. Exercise alone 
or combined with diet improves levels of liver enzymes, liver fat content, and also NASH on the liver histology. Exercise exerts beneficial effects not only in intrahepatic fat content, but also when, is, when there is no weight reduction and weight loss. This comparison evaluates the effect of 12 weeks programs of resistance training, high intensity interval training, and moderate intensity continuous aerobic training. There was randomization of 61 sedentary obese subjects with NAFLD in three arms. Uh, resistance training and high intensity interval training and moderate intensity training were equally effective in reducing hepatic fat content. But only high intensity interval training was effective in improving liver stiffness. The next study was published on 2016 and the aim of this study was to compare the effects of moderate and vigorous exercise on intrahepatic fat content. Participants were randomly assigned to three groups. First was jogging group, second brisk walking group, and third were no exercise. Both types of exercise reduce intrahepatic steatosis without significant differences, as you can see on the, on the last slide. And what about coffee? In the general population, frequent coffee and tea consumption were irreversibly related with liver stiffness, but no with steatosis. The consumption of tea and daily consumption of three or more cups of coffee was related to the presence of lower liver stiffness independent of other lifestyle factors. Also, previous studies have found a protective effect of coffee on the liver disease and reduction of risk of HCC. Let me please summarize that NASH and metabolic syndromes triples the risk for developing of NASH and fibrosis. Risk of developing NASH increases with the number of components of metabolic syndrome. One of the key things is that steatosis also inflammation and fibrosis respond to the sort of lifestyle changes that are recommended in terms of weight loss. Lifestyle interventions is for everybody, for the patient in low risk group and also for patient in high risk categories. Lifestyle changes in the treatment of NASH are effective and safe approaches, but often and massively underused. Fight for weight loss maintenance a lifelong challenge. We all know that these lifestyle changes are very difficult to achieve and we need uh, to find and use other effective, maybe pharmacological uh, treatments for the resolution of NASH and for the better prognosis of our patients. Thank you for your attention.